Good morning, morning. our Bethesda family and our visitors among us. We're glad to see all of you all out there. Um, We'd like to first off, we would like to welcome our our guest uh, minister who's going to help us with the worship service today, David Pretty, and his family sitting right here on the front row. We have um, uh, Michaela and David and Reese and Madeline, and I guess Rowan's in the nursery. Yep, so we're so proud to have you all here today. Thank you, David. Um, Just a few announcements. Um, uh, Just right here, I'll put it out, remind everybody that uh, homecoming is uh, about a month from today, about uh, four or five weeks, I believe it is, from today, and so start thinking about that. Get that in your calendar. It's going to be a fine day. Um, the session, we have a session meeting today at 4 and the deacons at 6. So um, that's, rem- remember that. Um, we had a, uh, we had, Sandy McLaughlin was in an accident, a, a bad car wreck, but she's okay. Right, Craig? She's okay, but she's in the hospital for a little while, observation, to make sure she's okay. Is that? Huh? She's home now. She's home now. Okay, so remember Sandy and Pat and that she gets to, uh, she's healed from her collision. Um, The other announcements, let's see, there's just a blood drive, that's a, that's a month from now, that's September the 30th. And um, also, remember about the volunteer guide that's in, that we put together, it's in the Narthex. And um, as we're kind of reorienting ourselves, our church family, and our own missions, um, this is a wonderful thing that's out there for us to um, plug into in the community. And so if you feel inspired to, uh, to volunteer, um, uh, check that um, bulletin out there in the North X, a guide, uh, volunteer guide. Um, in your, uh, in your, we have rally day, uh, Genesis Sunday rally day. We've got a couple different ways to describe it. Kickoff of our Sunday school year is September the 11th, uh, three weeks from today. And uh, we're gonna have a full breakfast um, served on at 9.30. And so if you can come prepared just to spend, to eat breakfast, and then we'll have our kickoff for our Sunday school program. And your insert in your bulletin today, um, take a look at that. And we're, we're, um, we are putting out there the uh, invitation to answer a call, if you feel called to, um, to be a part of the Christian education program in this church with a, as a teacher. And also this serves as sort of a survey for us to know exactly what to expect. So if you get it, we would encourage you to encourage this out whether you want to teach or, or not. Just encourage us, drop us out and give us a little bit of information here so we can help prepare for the new Sunday school year. Um, I think that that's it. And Kay? Good morning. <clears throat> the last time we had our review, we were answering, looking at the question 43 in the catechism. And that question was, what introduces the Ten Commandments? Uh, and the words that introduce the Ten Commandments are, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So today's question is question 44. What does the introduction to the Ten Commandments teach us? Would you read the answer with me, please? The introduction to the Ten Commandments teaches us that because God is Lord and is our God and Redeemer, we must keep all His commandments. Thank you. Deuteronomy 11.1, in this Moses is speaking to the Israelites 
and God had given Moses the first two tablets containing the Ten Commandments, but before he could present them, the Israelites had worshipped the golden calf, and Moses was so angry that he broke the tablets. This, this uh, what I'm going to read Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 11, 1, Moses is reminding the people that, that they are to love the Lord solely. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. From the Catechism for Young Children, question 44 is, whom did Christ represent in the covenant of grace? And the answer, his elect people. Because of our faith, in Jesus Christ as our Redeemer, we want to keep all of God's commandments. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to this historic pulpit. It's an honor to be in a church where God's Spirit has worked from generation to generation. And my prayer today is that God's Spirit will work today as well. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Jesus said, wherever two or three gather in my name, he is present. And again, the Bible says this promise. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Together, let's draw near to God in the call to worship. We do not gather in vain, for God is working in our hearts. Our worship strengthens and empowers us to share the gospel. The love of Jesus Christ shines in our lives. The love of Jesus Christ is at work in the world. Amen. Please stand with me and let us sing hymn 366.
Scripture says that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will cleanse us and forgive us of all unrighteousness. Let us take a moment to reflect on our sins and then go before the Lord in contrition. Let us pray. O oh God, you sowed the seeds of justice when you created this world. Though your bountiful creation has enough for everyone, it is hardly divided fairly. Some struggle to get their daily bread each day, and then some have more than they can use in their lifetime. We have so much, and yet there are those in our communities who can fit all their worldly possessions in a shopping cart. We know that you, O oh God, will defend the poor and come to them in their need, but we need your forgiveness. May we remember that all we have comes from you and that you have entrusted it to us. May we take your commandments to heart so we can do as Jesus asked. Use us, O oh God, to work in our ministries to end this despair. Amen. Hear the good news. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Indeed, God did not send his Son to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. Christ has died for us. Christ has risen for us. Christ reigns over us. And Jesus Christ prays for us. In Jesus' name, you are forgiven. Be at peace. Amen. This time, let us share that peace.
this means? This means thank you. So when we pray like this, we're saying thank you. Please, thank you. Now, have you ever seen anyone pray on their knees like this? No? Presbyterians historically do not like to do that. We like to stand. <laughs> Let's pray. Holy Father, pour out your spirit, the spirit of your son, Jesus Christ, and open the eyes and ears of our hearts that we might love you and obey you more faithfully. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first reading today in the Old Testament comes from Psalm, Psalm 90, verses 12 through 17. Psalm 90 12 through 17. Here's a reading. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Turn, O Lord, how long have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to your children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. Oh, prosper the work of our hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The New Testament reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. It's quite long, uh, so bear with me. Hear the reading. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You shall you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus, looking at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brother, brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. We can go ahead and acknowledge that this is the kind of scripture that will make you want to clutch your wallet. In the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we find this story repeated again and again and again. This curious young ruler approaches Jesus. Here he's not a ruler, but he's a young wealthy man. And he asks Jesus about eternal life. It's an indication that though he has wealth, he's still dissatisfied with life. And yet in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this man walks away every time. Because he doesn't have what it takes to enter into this life. He can't part with his wealth. The plot is the same. The characters are nearly the same. And the moral of the story is the same in each of these Gospels. Jesus says how hard it is for a wealthy person to enter the kingdom of God. But Mark's story is a little different. And that's what we're going to look at today. What sets Mark's story apart from the rest of the Gospels is that he focuses on the gestures. He focuses on the physical movements that take place in this story. That nonverbal communication, we call it, that goes on between people. You know the unspoken ways that we can make points by nodding our heads raising our eyebrows, or shaking our fingers. We all make these motions and motions like these, and they're suggestive of how we really feel and how we really think. Sometimes our physical expressions contradict our words. This is delicious. (laughs) 
I'm not angry. This sermon is so exciting. <laughs> We've all been in conversations with people where they're telling us something with their words, but they're really saying something else with their body. The best example of this is the Southern classic, the contorted smile and squinty eyes with a bless your heart. <laughs> but sometimes our nonverbals actually do reinforce our words. So I used to have a pastor who would look out at the children and say, I'm watching you. One of the reasons why we passed the peace for an awfully long time, by the way, uh, is so that our peace won't just be words, but it will be embodied. There's a confirmation that we really do get along if we're touching each other. And now, when Mark tells the story of the rich young man, he drops ruler, he draws our attention to all these physical cues. So in the other Gospels, this gets lost, it's obscured. But the rich young ruler in the other Gospels, throws out a question. It's more like a dialogue. But here in Mark's Gospel, there is a deep emphasis on those rich physical movements, those nonverbal gestures. They're communicating something that the language cannot. So we read the first, that this man runs to Jesus. This running ought to clue us into the fact that this man is pretty eager. Grown men don't really run especially not in the ancient world, and I would imagine not really at Bethesda either. Running isn't that dignified. You only run unless you're an athlete, or you're in battle, or you're in danger. But this man runs to Jesus because he's eager to learn. He's not like the Pharisees in the earlier chapter who want to test Jesus. This man is genuinely enthusiastic to come to Jesus. This man also kneels before the Lord. It says that he kneels to ask him about eternal life. In Matthew and Luke, it's unclear whether this man is being sincere, but the kneeling here says it all. He really wants to communicate to Jesus that he respects him. The kneeling, this man gets on his knees to show deference. This man gets on his knees to learn about eternal life. Next, we find the phrase, Jesus headed out. He was setting out on a journey. We already know where Jesus is going. He's headed to Jerusalem, and he's going to Jerusalem to meet the cross. But he pauses here to answer this man's question about eternal life. After all, this is what the journey to the cross is all about, eternal life. But the most striking gesture, which only shows up in Mark's gospel, occurs in verse 21. It says this, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Now this look is the type of look you make when your attention fixes on someone or something. You're not just staring off into space. You're not just searching for something. No, this kind of look is when you're beholding something or someone. You have them in your gaze. More than that, though, Mark tells us that Jesus, looking at him, loved him. This isn't just a, a stare, a curious stare. What in the world is that kind of stare? Or it is what it is kind of stare. No, this is what you might call the gaze of love. It's the look that you give those children when they come down here to the steps. It's the kind of look that happens between friends when there's an accomplishment. It's the kind of look that you see parents give to graduates. It's the kind of look that goes on between lovers. It's the gaze of love. It's a look of adoration and deep affection. It's the expression, I love you, without words and with the eyes. 
tempted to look at my wife just as a sermon illustration. It can come with a smile. It can come with an attentive stare. Love is a hard thing to hide. It shows up on your face, especially in your eyes, and it doesn't need words. Even though it's always pushing us to verbalize itself in compliments or confessions and songs and poetry and even shouts. Love wants to make itself loud, but it begins with a gaze. More importantly, though, this kind of love is John 3.16, love. The words are identical in the Gospel of Mark as they are in the Gospel of John. Jesus, looking at him, loved him with the same kind of love that impelled God to give up his only son that the world might have eternal life. Maybe you can already see the connection here. Out of great love, God gives His Son so the world may not perish but have eternal life. And in our story today, this very Son that was sent by God is looking upon this man with love who is seeking eternal life. This man experiences that eternal life-giving love that God has for the world in the face of Jesus. He gets to meet that eternal life that he's looking for in the face of Jesus. And it's a helpful image because this is really what we need to share with folks when we talk about the gospel. What is Christianity? What is it all about? It's about looking at the face of Jesus and saying, this is what God really looks like. A God of love. Holy love. And this is important because the gaze of love, this look of love, is essential to the call of discipleship. This man gets to hear Christ say, go sell what you own, go give your money to the poor, come follow me, leave it all behind. Again, he gets to hear all those things that make us wince and clutch at our wallets. But notice This man doesn't just hear directives, he also experiences a face, a look, a look that says it all. Mark's gospel will not divorce the verbal from the nonverbal, the directions from the gaze of Jesus. And the lesson seems to be that discipleship does not simply meet us as a commandment. Discipleship is not simply a commandment. Discipleship is also an encounter. The call, follow me, it doesn't come out of a void, but it comes from someone whose eyes are resting upon us with love. The call of discipleship is a call to meet God face to face in Jesus. You know, Mark is hinting at this, I believe, But the Apostle Paul fleshes this out more fully in 2 Corinthians. He says this, In the face of Jesus Christ, we are given the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Discipleship isn't just about obeying commands. It's also about looking back into the face of the one who speaks to us. It's stripping the veil off of our eyes so that we can gaze back at Christ. And ultimately, the hope is that when we come face to face with Jesus, we're going to change. We're going to want to follow him. Paul says this, all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though it's reflected in a mirror, are being transformed from one degree to another. When you frame it like this, the call is a call to attention. Repentance is a turning of our attention. And discipleship is a giving of our attention again and again and again. Why do I have to go to church on Sunday? Why do I have to pray and read? It's a giving of our attention again and again and again. To what? To Jesus. Jesus proclaimed in Scripture 
Jesus celebrated at the table. Jesus in the face of our brothers and sisters where God's Spirit is working. Discipleship isn't just commanding. It's a giving of our attention. Now we often think about the model of discipleship following Jesus. Jesus saying, call, call, follow me. And we're walking behind Jesus. We're following his footsteps. We're going where he goes. In other words, we're staring at Jesus' back. But that's not quite it. It would be better to think about following Jesus as following someone who's walking backwards so that we can always keep our eyes on his face. Jesus walking backwards to meet us. But the question is, why does this man turn away from that face? It's a question that each one of us have to wrestle with. We know and we have loved ones, friends and family members who get close to Jesus, who look and hear the call, and they walk away. Why is that? When the older translations, it says that this man's face fell. The newer translations say he grieved. He grieved. But literally it says his face fell. His face fell away from looking at Jesus Christ's face. And why? His possessions. His possessions put a veil on his eyes. And if we could frame it as a question that each one of us could go away with today, it would be this. Are we seeking God's face or are we seeking to preserve and keep our wealth? This is a pertinent question. Uh, question if you think about what's going on in our economy right now. Are we seeking God's face or are we worried and anxious about our wealth? Possessions can veil our eyes and make our face fall from Christ. But what's interesting is that when the disciples are astounded and shocked, it says that Jesus looked at them. We all know the words, it's possible with God, all things are possible with God, he says to them. Who will be saved, all things are possible with God, he says. But in Mark's version, it emphasizes this. Before he says that, he said, it, the text says, he looked at them. The same word, the same verb, the same gesture that he gives earlier to that man who's looking for eternal life. Jesus gazes at them. He wants them to see his face. I think Christ wants us to see that face today too. Don't let your face fall. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Follow him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand with me and let us sing page 215.
Together, let's affirm our faith by reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord God, we give you thanks for this day, and we have gathered here not only for ourselves, but also to entreat you on behalf of the world. We dare not do this on our own sake, but before our high priest, Jesus. We pray for our world. We pray that you continue to end the pandemic. We pray that you will continue to bless those who are in need. We pray for peace, that you would continue to send out Christians to bear witness to the good news of peace. We pray for our nation, for our president, and for our Congress, and judges, and all leaders in high places. We pray for our local leaders, mayors, and commissioners. We ask that you remember those who serve in emergency services, police officers, and firefighters, doctors, and nurses. We pray for teachers, especially during this time. Give them wisdom and skill that they might discern and lead others. We pray, Lord, for the church. We ask that you would bless the church that is suffering. May it receive comfort. And for the church that's asleep, may you wake us up. We pray for this church, that this church, Bethesda, would be a powerful place of the Spirit doing work in Aberdeen and the surrounding area. That you would bless each person here with gifts and knowledge of the gifts that you've given. That you would energize us here for mission. We pray, Lord, also for our loved ones, for those who are lost, lonely, sick, tired, broken, addicted, homeless, and in need. We lift them and entrust all these prayers up to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, who said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated as we give our offering. Remember the words of Jesus Christ, blessed are the poor in spirit.
Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you are holy, holy, holy. And now we offer up these gifts and tithes, and we ask that you would bless them, multiply them, that your work might be done here in this place to your glory, and that your glory might work through us. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Let us sing Jesus, the very thought of thee, page 629.